everyone. Welcome to a brand new episode of the Jams D Podcast, where you spin the jams and spill the tea. And this week, we're coming at you with a brand new now episode where we're going to talk about things going on in the world of music. And we have today's episode, which is uh, special. It's not exactly a topic episode. It's more of a... Uh, it, it, it's special. We're going to be talking today about the the latest contribution to the world of music from Rolling Stone and their list of the most inspirational LGBTQ plus anthems. So stick around for that, because it is certainly going to yield results. And for this discussion as well, we're going to be joined very shortly by the one and the only Miss Adequate Emily, frequent friend of, well, not frequent friend, friend of Infrequent the podcast. Infrequent friend. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, sometimes she's our friend, sometimes she wants us to burn in a lake of fire, you know, who knows. Very, very LGBTQ adjacent thought process, I must admit. Anyway, she's going to be joining us to very yourself, shortly. <laughs> she's be joining us very shortly to augment our discussions of music today, and particularly of that uh, auspicious release from Rolling Stone, which we're going to be talking through very shortly. But before then, we've got a lot of music we want to talk about that's come out recently that we want to run through, uh, starting with some albums that we haven't had space to review. Jake, why don't you tell us a little bit about this latest Queens of the Stone Age album and how you feel it holds up? Well. As previously mentioned on this podcast, last year we actually did an episode where we celebrated the anniversary of their classic record, Songs for the Deaf, an album that we all love very, very much. They are one of my favorite current active bands as well, so you could say I was looking forward to the latest record, In Times New Roman, tentatively anticipating it just because 2017 was the last time that they dropped six whole years ago with Villains, which was... I think easily probably the most divisive record in their discography thus far. An album that sort of yielded, I think, a uh, a sea change for Queens is because they needed to to sort of go back and maybe uh, pivot to a sound that their fans are perhaps a bit more familiar with, a bit more comfortable with. And that's kind of the name of the game for uh, In Times New Roman, which is... A very good album. I enjoy it myself with this record uh, about as much as I enjoy something like Villains, because I think this album is basically as good as those. Um, It's being seen as like a really big return to form after the previous record, and I can see why. The, the sound that they updated here feels a bit more in keeping with what you know this band for. This kind of blend of stoner rock of alt metal but it's like it's got these really colorful guitar tones on here it's interesting a lot of this album sounds a lot like era vulgaris mm. uh, another divisive entry in this band's catalog where they get really out there with some of the production and i like this element however i feel like it is applied with a bit of a reckless abandon to the point where it kind of oversaturates itself with this sound they really, like, it is a weirder sound for Queens of the Stone Age. It's just that they're all songs that are very weird sounding and very broadly the same way, the same sour guitar tones, the same, you know, fat bass. It, it's all very satisfying, but it does kind of run together a little bit. I think there are lots of great songs on here. Uh, I still think Carnivoyeur is maybe the best song that they've made since, probably like Clockwork. I would say uh, what the people say, uh, straight jacket fitting, uh, paper machete, all of these, I think, are top tier Queens of the Stone Age songs. And in fact, the strength of the singular songs in and of themselves is pretty solid. It's just that as an album, how it comes together, it doesn't really have the dynamism that I feel like, however you feel about villains, that album did kind of have that has some songs on there that are pretty structurally adventurous and interesting and different for the band. And here we're treading old ground pretty confidently and it's good. It's fun, but it's not something that blew me away. Like I kind of hoped that it would. Why, why the, decent song. But why did they have to call a song? What the people say, like a real muse ass song title, honestly, that gets, if we're being real fucking stupid. Wait, how, how is this? How is this spelled? Like, is it like people, people, or is it like P space pole? No, 
peephole. Like a peephole? Hole. Oh, peephole. See, I yeah. your fucking stupid accent sounded like pee hole or something. I don't know what's wrong with you, buddy. It's good Welcome to the Janky we'll Podcast. We're racist. <laughs> um, you cannot yeah. be racist I, I, against New Zealanders. I thought the album was a yeah. step up from villains, which I, I don't care for that record all that much. But and I think mainly it's a step up because it does really call back to that era of Algaris and to a certain extent lullabies the paralyzed sound as well. It's yeah. limier, it's got that real focus on on riff heaviness. Um and it but mixed with a kind of production sheen you would expect from you know a record made in this era it didn't leave as much of an impression as i was hoping especially based on how good the singles were I agree with your take on carnivore and the whole thing lyrically as well just has this kind of hangovery feel of like a disgruntled josh homie kind of talking about his divorce but also not really talking about it and the whole circumstances surrounding josh homie's divorce and personal life is so unpleasant that i wish i didn't know as much about it as i do so it's kind of a little bit of a headache to be reminded of it so yeah, it's a decent album. I just think that um, it could have been more. Um, but what about yeah, this? What about this new Killer Mike album, Jake? Which is an interesting thing uh... because we're celebrating also the tenth anniversary of the release of the very first Run the Jewels album this week too. So where do we check in with with Mister Michael Reinder at this particular juncture in history? Uh, well, we're checking in with Killer Mike as he pivots interestingly from the last major project that he was involved in which was rtj4 an album that we all liked very very much uh still like that still my favorite run the jewels album by the by which you know mike was basically at the peak of his lyrical form on there in my opinion and on here he's not really doing all that much like here's the thing about this album is that I feel like a lot of the discussion centered around this record is very much about Killer Mike's politics. He's espousing a lot of divisive political opinions that, you know, if you've been paying attention to the kinds of things he's been saying over the years, probably don't surprise you, but still inevitably disappoint you anyway. He's a moderate capitalist. That's the best way to describe it. It's really not my main complaint with the record, because honestly, the whole thing is just so boilerplate like this is killer mike at his most autopilot like even on features he sounds way more animated than he does on his own record here he stretches himself so thin with this very very standard kind of atlanta sort of trap hybrid sound that just like you know you think that that would work well for killer mike and I mean, it's fine. Like, it's just kind of okay. He He's competent behind the mic and... Behind the mic! Woohoo! Oh, good pun. I did it. I can't envision why anyone would want to listen to Killer Mike over no ID beats. Like... I'm not trying to say that he deserve that he ex- he should forever be solely produced by LP because I'm not saying he should be boxed into that. But there's something... Saying so- that uncanny and dissonant and wrong about hearing killer mike over like no id beats and like sort of modern trap percussion it's so jarring i want to briefly because we're going to have to do we've got a lot to cover and we've only got about three hours to record so we're going this is going to be fairly whirlwind so there's nothing wrong with that i want to briefly so it's going to be about a swans album length yeah but we're going to achieve a lot more than swans do in that amount of time um gandhi I want to briefly acknowledge the new Sigur Rós album, which has partly because it's been so under-promoted and partly because I think people kind of forgotten a little bit about Sigur Rós because they hadn't put out an album in 10 years. Their new album, Atta, has kind of gone a little bit under the radar. I think not many people are necessarily even aware that it exists. I, I didn't know it came out. Yeah. Our, our friend Luke was in a similar position this week where we told him we were listening to it and he's like, there's a new Sigur Rós album? And I'm like... Ah, uh, that's a bad sign. It took them a while to record it, and they just didn't want to promote it, and so they surprised released it with a uh, one advanced single earlier this month or last month now. And I've listened to this album a lot. It has become you know. the most listened album of the year for me. I think it's fantastic. It is something that will not deliver everything that everyone wants from Sigur Ross because it is them in a very specific mode. But it is 
<clears throat> I mean, it's hauntingly beautiful. I wrote an essay about it that I still don't know what to do with, but it exists. So I'm not going to talk about it a little bit too much, but um, I think the new Sigur Rós album is incredible and it captures so much of what makes them such an emotionally evocative and powerful band, even if you don't really know what the hell Yonzi is ever singing about or what the point of any of it is. There is a triumphant heft to this particular record that it, it just completely emotionally crushes me every time I listen to it. I think it's masterful and it's certainly going to be on my top 20 albums of the year list. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to give it a shout out, acknowledge acknowledge its existence and explain why we're not covering it in further detail. We just haven't had the space for it. It's been a crash course of albums this month. Oh my God. Yeah, there's a lot to talk about. Especially if you're like me and you've only heard a gay disbirion. So. A gay oh, what? what? No, just a, a gay what? <laughs> what did you call me? <laughs> anyway. oh, what? Pride month is over now, so. Not uh, in the US oh, it isn't. Burn it like a gay parade, motherfuckers. <laughs> Pride month may be over, but we are going to be discussing gay shit uh, in a short time, so stick around. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> stick around for gay shit later in this episode of the Jams and Tea podcast, live on the Jams and Tea YouTube channel. I'm going to plow on, and just because I want us to run through some singles that came out in the last week and a bit that are worth acknowledging. Uh, first up, uh, one that Jake and I had a collective orgasm listening to together for the first <laughs> time it was a really like it was an, it was a really like beautiful moment of like sheared homosexuality when we reacted to this new single from it's don't call them radiohead it's the smile and they're back with a new song called bending hectic uh the first taste of their next oh, album which apparently hectic. won't be dropping until next year unfortunately but we have this song and it is incredible jake why don't you tell us a little bit about the experience of listening to this song i had no precedent for this whatsoever riley and i just threw this on at the same time and we were listening to it and it starts it's very much starts in that kind of really interesting kind of jammy almost kraut rock adjacent stuff that they were playing with on the first album and then suddenly you get fucking doom metal radiohead it halfway through this song and it's like oh holy shit and then it just becomes so much bigger heavier and more expansive than anything any of these musicians have ever made and i was just like i i loved the smile debut don't get me wrong but this is the best thing that they have made so far and if everything else is on the level with this this is some next level shit <laughs> I'm yeah, so excited. It's, it's something you kind of just have to have been lucky to have experienced, but just Jake and I listening to this together after it dropped, having no idea what we were in for and just like having this moment of just being stunned out of our minds. It was special. And, um, and you know, the song is, is, is heartbreaking. I mean, lyrically, it's a song about, you know, contemplating ending it all. And it has this massive weight to it. As the title suggests, there are these really unique and attractive sort of bent guitar tones in the song that sound really eerie and alien and add this foreboding atmosphere to it before you get these pendericky strings that come in five minutes in and make you feel like you're in Twin Peaks, the return episode eight, before the doom metal comes in at the end. It's an incredible piece of music uh, that I wanted to shout also out. Also in Twin Peaks, the return episode eight. Yeah, it featured in that, even though it was not to be really yeah. about a six. Years. Well, no, that's that's the that's the bomb, you know, right? Yeah, See, it's 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 a deep reference. You got to be a real real lynch head to get it. Yeah, right. The what? smile, the smile dropping. This song is a part of the promo for Oppenheimer. Yeah, it's exactly exact. What no, yeah, it all fits. Yeah, so that was great. Uh, Jake, I know also that something very close to your heart happened this week, which is that Slow Dive returned with a comeback single. Do you want to tell us a little bit about Woo! this? Uh, all right. If y'all know me, y'all know I'm the biggest slow dive head in the fucking world. If I, in like the three years that we've been doing this podcast, if I had to pinpoint what band I've spent the most time listening to, Slow Dive are head and shoulders at the top of that list. Um, I have a disgusting amount of scrabbles on Suvlaki. It, it's it's bad. 
But for the first time, we are hearing from them since their 2017 self-titled My Personal Favorite Slow Dive album came out. We got their new single for a new album coming this year called Everything Is Alive, going to drop this September, I believe. I have already pre-ordered the vinyl alongside the single Kisses, which... If you know Slow Dive, you'll know that they have kind of dabbled in a couple different sounds, even though they're, you know, they're known as the Suvlaki band, the the shoegazy kind of stuff. But on stuff like Pygmalion, they do some, you know, talk talk esque post rock. Uh, their first album is a little bit more similar to that sort of, you know, ride my bloody Valentine venue of shoegaze. And then the 2017 album is way more just kind of like straight dream pop. And this seems to be following in the stead of the 2017 self-titled of being very kind of ethereal, very pretty, very like pop and hook driven. And I have been listening to this single nonstop ever since it came out. It is a lovely, beautiful little song. Very much reminds me of stuff like the radio department, uh, which I know, again, as another band that this podcast loves very much. Very just like singularly melancholic, but also kind of weirdly uplifting. And it makes me so so very happy. I'm very, very anxious to see what this album is going to pan out and be once we actually get a hold of it, whether or not we're going to get a new single, but I'm just happy one of my favorite bands are back. Woo! I'm listening to it right now. It reminds me of like a 90s Cranberry single in the best way. I love 90s Cranberry so much. It reminds me Pretty of calm. something like that, but a bit more kick to it Yeah. in a way. Mm-hmm. It almost sounds like if you mixed it with a little bit of a danceability off that you could have on like a post-punk album mixed in there it's definitely great to have slow dive back i well i want to draw attention to the music video for the song which has just the most like the most like painfully like twee like alt you know we're all bisexual and yep. and we're like all, yep. you know it's just the most On motorcycles looking sad it is actually parodic is what it is and I, I i honestly as someone who is incredibly cringe and loves a lot of incredibly cringe music that takes things emotionally too far i fully approve of how just i was gonna say like we are any different <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> like perks of being wallflower core shit it's like mm-hmm. and it's like and that's a nice note as well because that whole perks of being a wolf our world of like alt indie hipster teen stuff like that whole world obviously listen to the dive. smiths on repeat yeah, and listen to suvlaki on repeat right like because yeah that's a whole that fits in reg iraqi adjacent yeah like there's no way that gregory chaboski wasn't slamming allison on repeat while <laughs> writing that book that's true anyway it's probably Facts. i probably could have chosen a better verb there but it doesn't matter Speaking anyway. of Greg, uh, Greg Araki, do you think, like, if his full name is Gregory, does he have the, t- is it like G R G G O R Y? I don't know what you're asking, but no. No, yes. Yes. <laughs> that would be a, an amazingly unhinged way of spelling Gregory. I think, for one, he would do it. I think he should, like, put a double G at the start as well. No, 100%. It should so be Gregory. G- g- Anyway, I want to quickly run through some singles that I've been really into this week that are particularly Riley core. Uh, first of all, I want to shout out that Animal Collective have released the 20 minute lead single for their next album. It's the closest that they have ever sounded to Feels since they were in that era, but distinctly more, it's like the back half of Feels. It's like the more ephemeral stuff on Feels, but it has this sort of, you know, as you would expect from a 20 minute animal collective song this moderately paced sort of woozy almost sort of campfire songs esque at Daffy this duck esque yeah it's yeah. like a mixture of campfire songs and feels and it just it's this particular atmosphere that's so uh well captured and and, and lucid while i'm listening to it and i think the song builds and progresses really beautifully and crests in this lovely place really excited for the next album whenever it drops hopefully it drops this year wanted to shout that one out i'm so happy to see animal collective back to a lot of sounds that i think they did well since they kind of got into a bit of a rut around with painting with i feel like those big four animal collective albums all kind of feel like they fit into a perfect season yeah i listen to strawberry jam because it's my favorite a lot during the summer and also because i listened to it when i was graduating high school a lot it's a and great summer album feels is very springish it reminds me of like a rainy forest tongue songs is very fall like and of course with its synths merry weather possibility it fits very well in winter yeah i think that's beautifully a beautiful description of the arc of those albums 
So yeah, having those atmospheric sounds back, very cool. <laughs> I agree. I want to shout out something that's a little bit more under the radar, unless you're a, a serial reader of Stereo Gum like I am. There's a great indie rock band called Rat Boys that I celebrated earlier this year with the release of their incredible single uh, Black Earth, Wisconsin, which is still my in my top three songs of the year. May still be my favorite single of the year, if I'm perfectly honest. They're an incredible great-grandpa adjacent progressive indie rock band with a bit of a war on drugs mixture of Americana and indie rock and this real presence that I absolutely adore. Uh, they came back with another single this week, which is the I think the second single for their upcoming album. Uh, which is called The Window. Uh, the song is the title track of the record as well. It's incredible. I think this, if you're particularly into the Americana fused with indie rock strand of uh, music that we've been talking about lately with bands like Wednesday, then this should be right up your alley as well. Um, I mentioned Great Grandpa again just because they're very jams and T-core and the singer's voice is very similar. Um, so yeah, all those reference points, if you enjoy those, check these singles out. I think the album is probably my most anticipated album of the year at the moment, just because all the singles have been incredible and I am completely in love with the personality and presence of this band and with the guitar playing as well, which is electric. I also want to shout out big news, big news. <laughs> How did I do that? Oh boy. Uh, because we had <laughs> you transformed into a clown for a second. <laughs> I'm really excited. Big news. <laughs> because Sump is back. Guys, Sump is back. The legendary RB solo artist who dominated 2016 and 2017 in particular. Sump is back in pog form. <laughs> what the fuck are you talking about? I love about? that reference. Sump. <laughs> who thank put out you, one of my you. favorite albums of 2017, Process, yeah. came off the back of a series of features with Kanye West and very high-profile pro, high collaborations as a supporting artist, uh, finally coming into his own with that incredible debut album, which I still think is one of the best R&B records of the entire 2010s, but also one of the best kind of UK garage dub records, one of the best electronic records. There's a real sense of like, of, of that, heavy 90s techno edge underneath the R&B on that album which just makes it a really tantalizing fusion and I still think it really really holds up and so some uh, blood on me is still a favorite to oh, me his voice has he got an incredible voice Sartre does and he uses it so well so not afraid to experiment it with it either add overdubs and things like that if it works in the song I some some R&B singers that have such a great voice will just let the voice he was talking I like that Sampa does so much with it well, he's dynamic because he has those like yeah. really eclectic and well-built sort of opus tracks, but he also has songs like No One Knows Me Like the Piano, which is yeah. literally just him and the piano and it's fucking devastating. A yeah, new song is called Spirit 2.0. He's leveling up and he's back. And it's, oh, uh, yeah, it's, it's fucking awesome. It's Sampha. Sam What's actually funny is that Sampha dropped this song on the same day that James Blake dropped the lead single for his upcoming album. James Blake, someone, an artist that I used to have a great deal of fondness for, who now has disappeared so far into the ether of boring, wuss-core, trap-adjacent, whiny white boy music that I can't stand him anymore. And it was a really interesting moment because James Blake, who is one of the most influential artists in electronic music of the early 2010s, James Blake is so obviously someone who's very clearly influenced Sampha as a producer and a performer, right? That first Sampha album process is so obviously bears the fingerprint of james blake and yet sample dropping his comeback single on the same day that james blake drops his lead single and fucking wiping the floor with james <laughs> blake i mean this dude james blake's song is fucking weak source it's boring <laughs> as shit i fucking hated that last james blake album by the way i know most people were kind of pretty warm to positive on it and that's fine i couldn't stand it friends that break your heart Get the fuck over it, man. I couldn't fucking stand that shit. Anyway. I, I like to joke that James Blank is basically just Bonnie there, but a few years later. You just inadvertently called him James Blank, which is a beautiful That's yeah. That I'm making. <laughs> I think still think James Blake has obviously a lot of talent as a producer, but I just have no interest in his music anymore. I'll check out the new album. Maybe I'll like it. But Sampha wipe, wiped the floor with, with it, basically. His new song is fantastic and basically gives me everything I need from, everything I would want from a James Blake song, but also with the particular personality and energy and style of Sampha. 
uh, himself. So yeah, check that out. I thought it was great. Uh, let me know. Flame me if you think I'm off base with the James Blake single diss. I just couldn't. I just thought the song was boring as shit. Um, but maybe you like it. My favorite single of the week, uh, maybe my favorite single of the last month, who knows, is the new single from the legendarily impossible to describe and famously cryptic and mysterious band The Armed. We reviewed this band's last record, Ultra Pop, uh, when it came out in 2021. They are the seemingly the brainchild of Mr. Kurt Ballou, who has concocted this uh, confection of young hip metal and weirdo musicians essentially and produced every record they've made up to this point they're a bizarre band and i mean that was a bizarre album that i think really confounded us a little bit when we tried to figure out not only how to describe it but also how whether we even liked it um but i so the armed i i 100 approve of the arm and armed in concept but i was always a little bit like i want to fully get on board with the music but they've out they've announced a new album called perfect saviors and a lead single called Sport of Form. And I fucking love this song. It is a weird digital mayhem hyper pop crossed with indie rock, crossed with folk, just electric banger with Julian Baker as a guest singer and a weirdly anthemic like Arcade Fire But When They Were Good-esque anthemic chorus at the end. It's a bizarre song that should not work nearly as well as it does. But I have to admit, I find it completely beguiling. I just think it's ridiculous in every sense, but totally pulls it together with the final thread. It's actually a song that makes that is a complete catastrophe on first listen for the first like 90% of it. And then the last 10% of it just ties it together, like at the final moment. And then you listen to it again, and you're like, oh shit, the whole thing's great. But on the note of hyperpop, also want to say a rest in peace to PC Music, who officially called it quits this year. Uh, I mean, this is a kind of like symbolic burial because PC Music, I mean, not only have they not been relevant for at least five years, but they haven't really been putting out much music anyway. So it's kind I mean, of like the founders of it have been prolific. They just moved on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But like AG, AG Cook and Sophie sort of moved beyond the label at that point to founding bubblegum bass and hyperpop and all those and combine them into this well yeah pc music was um you know i think of more of artists like danielle hall and hannah diamond and the immortal cutie as well uh these particular symbols of pc music's prominence in like 2017 2018 uh, and i mean that hannah diamond album was produced by sophia or no cutie was produced by cutie's Cutie album was produced, was produced by, by sophie and um yeah the hannah diamond album was produced by uh ag cook and daniel hart anyway that i don't have much of a thesis here i just wanted to acknowledge that you know the official resting of pc music because pc music was incredibly like important to me in like 2018 2019 when i was like coming to terms with my God, let me just fucking stop sounding like a fucking loser but when i was coming to terms with my sexuality that music was gay well how yeah. dare you be gay that's so embarrassing i know it's not could you imagine if someone here was trans or gay <laughs> um so yeah rest in peace pc music wanted to throw it up if you're a fan of PC music or if it means something to you, drop your favorite PC music songs in the comments below. I'd love to be able to bond with some of our listeners over that because yeah, that wasn't for a moment. PC music was big. And PC going back music to those tracks. Uh, really PC music was how I discovered Sophie. I remember, I remember around when it's okay to cry. I uh, got released and I wasn't seeing that much press about it at the time, like in early in late 2017. And I remember being like, is this, is, is she trans? And I looked up and it's like, yeah, oh it's God. easy to forget now that there was a time where Sophie was incredibly popular before she was openly trans. No, and there was an article written about her that accused her of appropriating women's voices in electronic music. That's right. I remember that. And that was like, what, what they, the sweet summer children had no idea. <laughs> um, so yeah, big shout out to that particular era where, you know, it was really heralding a new dawn for the voices of trans people in popular music. Uh, let's move on. Uh, none other than the Mars Volta's D. Laust in the Comatorium uh, turned 20 this week. I mean, 
a, a, a hugely important album to all of us um and and there's never a bad time to go back and listen to it i mean yeah I being an incredibly important album to you august i wanted to throw over and see if you had anything that you've been listening to recently or anything that you want to talk about in general or shout out in terms since you're you know seldom on the podcast in recent times i wanted to give you an opportunity to shout mm. out or talk about anything that has taken your fancy recently yes yes so uh one thing i i wanted to shout out was uh a, a band i've I have never like fully loved, but I've enjoyed a fair bit for the past four years through their through their occasional releases, and that being the group Night Tapes, who have recently put out an EP called Perfect Kindness. Now, Night Tapes are a sort of a dream pop adjacent group. If anything, I'd say their sound uh it, it is definitely a bit shall we say inspired by the work of cocteau twins but i i think they're uh the the palette of dream pop they bring is is quite uh it's quite nice it's pretty uh the songs themselves are very listenable and their record and all of their eps have been short sweet to the point uh lush kind of ethereal dream pop that i think uh certain members jake on this podcast uh might click with and even get something out of even if it may not necessarily be the most inventive version of the genre but certainly an admirable effort in my eyes i listened to the uh the debut breaking benjamin album not debut uh phobia it's not the debut i'm dumb might as well be (laughs) It, yeah, it's it's functionally the the debut of. They can't be a band who have more than one actual album. Uh, unfortunately, they do. Uh, I they I remember like at least another one yeah. being popular. I remember Dear Agony being at least a little bit popular. The the story behind listening to this is is more funny. Or something getting in the way. No, no, it it actually involves uh, car crashes. Uh, so I was watching a video of, uh, you know, just horrific car crashes in NASCAR throughout NASCAR history for whatever reason. It was like You're doing it one, for Dale. Yeah, doing it for Dale. It was one in the morning. I was pretty bored. And uh, there was this song playing in the background of, of you know, just the horrific pileups and deaths of multiple NASCAR drivers. And that track was Diary of Jane. <laughs> which... I was going to say, I, 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 I can I... fancy, I guess, when it comes to breaking. Yeah. Kind of... They got uh, like one song. <laughs> exactly. And that one song is admittedly not bad. I didn't no, mind no, it. No. I don't fact... think I like it as much as when I was a teenager. No, no. Well, in fact, I'd say this whole album, stunningly okay. Mi- the mixing here is okay. Everything comes through pretty clear. Production is nice. Uh, it's maybe a little silly, a little teenage angsty, but I didn't mind well, I it, mean, all things considered. Yes. No, they, they cooked with that one. I'll be honest. No, they, they kind of cooked. I, I have to, uh, I have to concur with that. I will say, st- I will say though, of those mid two thousands uh, hard rock bands that all kind of mushed together, I will always be more partial to Three Days Grace. I don't know why. Hey, we, I we don't do know love ourselves some Three Days Grace. Days. On I, I I hate to admit it, but I will still listen to I Hate Everything About You, despite how fucking <laughs> it sounds like a dude who's had a little too much Bud Light jump walking like this around like a demolition derby <laughs> like <laughs> uh, t- talking about his ex-wife like it's still like it still begs musically to me i mean there's worse stuff from that period too that i used to listen to that i, I don't anymore yeah. i'm not gonna listen we, we are scholars of this particular era of music here in of Gen- the butt rock era it is it is a recurring yeah. bit that we spend all too much time talking about one or another relic of that godforsaken of, period and pop of the godforsaken <laughs> butt rock era. Yeah. yeah, I used to think Stained was good as a kid. I I, I don't have hey, any excuse for look, that one. We had a segment earlier this year, in one of our now episodes, where I passionately defended "It's Been a While" as like I, a, a legitimately great song. I would also say "Outside" is not too bad either, as long as it's not the fucking live one that gets played all the time with fucking. Fred Durst, Biloxi. 
Always, yeah. I mean, look, the least said about fucking Aaron, what is it, Aaron Paul, whatever his name is, least said about his solo work. The Jake bit. Paul. The less said about Jesse. Hey. The least hey, said oh, about so much. his solo work, the better. Do you guys know that Stained released their first single in like 12 years? Wait, what? Ago? He he really? made a whole he called it selling out for years. What do you mean he's back? <laughs> the man who wrote Am I the Only One has no scruples. Also, I'm looking at Aaron Lewis's rate your music page for like his list of singles. He appeared on apparently a he was featured at a Leonard Skinner concert in 2015 that was recorded as a live album. Oh shit. That man is from Western Massachusetts. If we continue down this line of discussion any longer, I think we might lose two right. brain cells to yeah. continue so, functioning. Continue. So let's, yeah, let's talk about something that's far more highbrow, intellectual, and will not result in the loss of any brain cells. The one, the only, Toby Mac. Toby's back! He's back. The Mac is back. Listen to I on it. Are we still here? Just to suffer. Hell yeah. Oh, uh, you know it. So it, as per my punishment for last year's quiz, which I am long overdue to completing, I, I have decided to get back on the Mac train, get back on it, get back on Daddy Mac's train, or get back on the Mac Daddy's smackerati. Uh, I'll <laughs> stop right now on the note of this album having a song on it called uh, Mac Daddy, which is our our true dog feature. True Dog, may he rest in peace. Uh, <laughs> is this the last True Dog album? <laughs> unfortunately, not. Uh, he oh. is on more. Well, then, unfortunately, unfortunately, fortunately, surely, fortunately, he is on more. Yes, yes, that that is what I said. Um, <laughs> anyway, this you song is down to, to a poo. Well, August, I wish you <laughs> died <laughs> earlier. First the first song on this album's called Me Without You? Yeah, it's called Me Without You. And it, it's a love song to God hey. about God not being there. That's hey, so hey, fucking look. funny. If you know anything about the band Me Without You, that's hilarious. Two, two Christian artists. Oh, and, and what's, what's better is that... Uh, God is my favorite Christian artist. Every third song on this album, like to to a rule, is this like overproduced synthetic like I, I mean picture 2012 EDM in your head, and it sounds exactly like that, that blown out, shitty, terrible sounding Is this Toby a little Max? bit of bro step? Yes, is this absolutely. Toby Max the second law. I would say so, but I know he's got more CEDM. Uh, that stands for Christian Electronic Dance Music for, uh, for the Uneducated. See, now I want to hear what a Muse Christian rock album sounds like. <laughs> and uh, yes, we have more I'm songs good. on here. Just <laughs> extolling the virtue, you know, Toby Mac's classic virtues of, of family value. There's a track on here called Family naturally and yeah i mean at this point it's pretty standard fare for toby like it's nothing too funny it's nothing too crazy except for the aforementioned mac daddy which is a a song where true dog is is begging his father to buy him a a mac and let me let me pull up like the jacket? lyrics no like uh, like the computer oh oh <laughs> uh, dad when are we going to order this mac you got the cash. I'm close. Laugh. Is he actually shilling for Apple, or is this just because he's? Th this is Toby. just because of the the Mac overlap in name, and what's great is that he refers. It's actually featuring Macklemore too. Oh, I wish that would make this so much better. It, it, genuinely, the hook here is: I want a Mac. I want a Mac, Daddy. I need a Mac. I want a Mac. I want a Mac, Daddy. I need a Mac. Them apples don't grow on trees. I need that like XXX Tentacion Queen Elizabeth, like down the middle. <laughs> Except it's Toby Mac and Macklemore. Oh, yeah. You know, this is a very deep song referencing the uh, forbidden fruit, and uh, big tech is basically analogous here for the temptation which Eve uh, felt. And Toby Mac is is God in this song. Uh, his son is no, Eve. He's, he's God in real life. And in real That's life. blasphemous, yes. Toby. Toby Mac, you are a false prophet. Yeah, but this song is hilarious. A, for no, the, really the weird... Hilarious. 
the weird sexual connotation of of referring to your own father as a Mac daddy. So a reference I am sure that flew entirely over Tobias's head. It's just a weird song and for sure the highlight of the record here. The title track I on it is is pretty all right. We've got Toby Mac as like a as like a race car driver. He's got his eye on the prize, but the only person who can keep him focused is the big G. I'm talking God. <laughs> I, I I can't wait to hear your thoughts on the next Toby Mac album, be, solely because I see it has a D- DC talk <laughs> feature on it. <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm so fucking excited. That's that's gonna be great. Uh, there's one more thing I want to talk about slash show you all before we get into our main discussion topic, which is uh, my favorite news item of the week. And that is that none other than Mr. Aubrey Graham, Drake himself, has released a book of poetry. The, the book is called Titles Ruin Everything, A Stream of Consciousness by Kenza Samir and Aubrey Graham. And it's like, the, the the that title is written across the back and front covers of the book so if you actually look at the front cover of the book it only has like the second half of the title and of the uh, author credits which is just hilarious oh to me. and oh, i saw a picture of it so i thought bad. it was a printing error <laughs> it, 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 it's amazing and look and i just want to take a moment here hopefully it'll work hopefully you'll all be able to hear it i want to take a moment here to uh watch this brilliant video of dj khaled himself explaining the book the and reacting to it in real time i think it's a really really special um piece of uh a piece of history really that we're piece of art really we're gonna observe i'll put this in museums one day courtesy of the boy coming close um if you haven't got uh All drake's right. new book you're behind time <laughs> Courtesy of the boys, the new book. The streets behind. Like the cover already. Life isn't fair, but karma helps. The boy's special now. Hold on up. Some days I got it all figured out. The boy is special. But most days I never learn. You think I'm making this up, right? Like this, this is how the boy. Y'all, I, listen, the boy. Wait, that's actually boy, what it looks wait. like. Oh my god. The minute gosh. you think you figured out, the boy, <laughs> the man writes a book. <laughs> he's giving you keys each key leads to the, ne- to the next key i don't let me read some more hold on hold on me playing a- something other than me has got to give <laughs> see i'm taking my time oh. reading because like no you think i'm joking look this the man wrote a book he wrote a sentence <laughs> I think I'm joking, look. Please. You wrote a sentence! main character syndrome, if you ask me. I told her I'm going crazy. She said, without me. I'm not mad. Listen, y'all think I'm making this up like, the boy got a book. The boy got a book. Once you think you figured out Drake. I'm starting to think Drake might have a book. Drake, so. You ain't figuring uh, out. What, what led you to that conclusion, Emily? First of all, I don't know. He hasn't mentioned it yet. Every loser. No, no, I, I thought it's very so. subtle. <laughs> it's it's. Uh... I'm not making this up. Whoa. Go get the boy. <laughs> and if you didn't know who the boy is, that's Drake, Six God. You know, I learned that I can't. You know. Did he say Six God? Know everything. I learned that a long time ago. Get the book. It's gonna be number one seller. Oh hey, my god. I have not been able to stop watching this. Everything about it is in, is brilliant. My favorite thing is that he doesn't think to clarify who the book is by, who the boy is, until the <laughs> very end of the video. And just the whole recurring thing of like, no, no, look, you've got to see it. Just shoving <laughs> each page into the camera. I'm not making this up. The boy's different. I, I'm starting to think that Drake both has a book and is different. I just think if I made something and sent it to one of my contemporaries and their most prominent reaction to it was, I'm not making this up, look. 
I probably kill myself. The way DJ Khaled responded to some of that, some of those terrible, terrible poems proves that he might be the greatest hype man on earth as he reads the courtiest thing I've ever heard in my life. And he's like, these are the keys to life. <laughs> he's giving you the key. Each key leads to the next key. That's how keys work. <laughs> that, that's my favorite part. Each key leads to the next key. It's just a bigger key each time. It just keeps getting bigger with a tiny keyhole in it. Hmm. Exactly. Anyway, that's uh, oh, something wow. that I felt that we all needed to bask in. And now oh, we can move absolutely. on to the main topic of discussion today, which is this new list from Rolling Stone. Now, it's not the greatest oh, LGBTQ songs of all time. Let's be clear that the Billion is the most inspirational LGBTQ songs of all time. So we're gonna I'm gonna run through the list. We're gonna count them down. There's 50 of them on the list. We're gonna talk about what we think of each pick and look not all the picks are bad but there's and it's not even okay it's a pretty bad list i think it's a pretty terrible list to be frank but what's terrible about it is not that it's a selection of bad songs oh, we'll mention frank at some point <laughs> although there are a lot of bad songs on it what's terrible about it is not necessarily the songs themselves but the image and the the, the whole thing that this desperately trying to remain relevant and painfully white Mag historical magazine white republican conservative well think it, tank magazine well it, no it's a symbol of how so many so much of that kind of historical media has attempted really cringingly to rebrand themselves as ambassadors of pride <laughs> and all <laughs> things you know and, and queer rights and all that sort of stuff and so i think that the the list itself will give some interesting insights and so i'm going to count this down and let's talk about. Oh, should I put up? Should I put the flag back up? <laughs> is, it, is it okay to be gay again? Well, I mean, not yet. Anyway, so the fifty most inspirational LGBTQ songs of all time. Number fifty is uh, Callum Scott's "Rise." Uh, I I don't know who this is. Uh, does anyone know who this guy is? Oh Are yes, uh, I, well, yeah. Someone I've, please tell me who this man is. Yeah, I've uh, I've listened to this song. It's uh, it's a very inspirational, aspirational song. I really liked the the pop groove this had. The ba oh, the bass. No. Was you are good a dirty fucking liar, August. No, you are no, a not. filthy I'm, fucking liar. <laughs> I want to. I'm I'm I'll, I'll, I'm being I'll, honest. What I'll do as we go through these is I'll read some of because to me what the funniest thing about this whole list is is not even necessarily the picks. It's the absolutely anodyne. I would have fucking voted for Obama three times if I could ask fucking descriptions of these songs. All right. I will say I didn't know who Caleb Scott was. If you want to know, I went oh no. When I looked up Caleb Scott, it's because I found out that he is the one that did the slow version of Dancing on My Own. Disgusting. <laughs> You're going to see me rise, English singer-songwriter Caleb Scott sings, in this triumphant dance track, inspired by his own coming out experience. This is a song that can make you feel empowered even in moments of defeat. The way Scott's soft intro builds into a full-on belt can give any listener chills. Number 49 on the list is Ethel Kane's American Teenager. Which is yeah, <laughs> a, rare, a rare moment of connection here with our particular tastes and the things that we enjoy in uh, queer music. But also, is this really an inspirational LGBTQ song? I mean, it's it's about feeling lost. It's about thinking, coping thinking. with the world around you by drinking underage and feeling like you're alone. Like, it literally, if it's literally about being trans with the lyric, like, what is wrong with, like, Jesus, if you could help me, why do I feel alone in this world? It's not uh, exactly what comes to mind when you think of inspiration. Rolling Stone describes the song as a nostalgic indie folk anthem about the fleeting promise of the American dream. It, Get the what? fuck out of here! Anyway, number 48 on the list is Kelly Clarkson's What Doesn't Kill You Makes You... <laughs> Shut no. the fuck up. <laughs> Kelly has released some of my favorite pop songs of the last 20 years. I think bangers. I consistently had bangers, and I don't even dislike this song. I it, do. It's a good song. <laughs> Anything past my December, I'm not into. Oh, it's just simply a song about a hard breakup. It's a perfect pump-up anthem for anyone enduring a rough stretch of road. It works well when you're feeling down. Mm. But it's just as effective when you're getting ready to go out and conquer the night. 
Whoa. The funny thing is when I hear stronger, what I don't think of is dance clubs and holding your head up high. I think of minivans. I think yeah. of yeah. moms <laughs> waiting Car in line at schools. Yeah. <laughs> Number 41 is a pick that I'll go to bat for, even though the artist is slightly forgotten now, which is Mika's happy ending. You have to be a very, oh, yeah. you have to have been a very specific kind of either closeted or just, or out, I suppose, you know, exuberant queer kid to really get fully on board with Mika and know more than just Grace Kelly. But that exuberant, like over the top, ridiculously ostentatious uh, brand of Europop that Mika did in like t- the late 2000s is, you know, I'm glad that there's a shout out there. Number 40 is just Ariana Grande and Zed's Break Free. I mean, oh, I know a lot of gay people fucking... who like Ariana. I like Ariana, and yeah, this is a same. song that's like way earlier on in her career where it's. Yeah. Sh- Sing, she's singing like she has cotton balls stuck in her mouth. She's like, I want to break free. Like, she can't, she doesn't right. pronounce the fucking R's in her singing. The thing about Ariana like, is never. that she's like, she has both some of the biggest and greatest pop singles of the last 10 years and like peppered in between some of the most fucking dead on arrival bomb ass fucking no one cares except three people's stupid songs and yeah break free is kind of at 40 ariana grande's hit single put your hearts up anyone remember fucking what was that one song that my fucking ex-girlfriend in high school used to play all the time Uh, oh you tell me bitch i don't know problem but the other one that she released after that it was just like basically her doing problem again a focus that's it god that song i love i love focus i disagree with you on that one actually i love focus fair enough um 39 is ellie goulding's anything could happen which is a fucking snore of a song i'm sorry really i love it i i like ellie goulding singles she's she's someone that i i I root for 38 is is bronski beats small town boy which is the first like properly i get that this is an actual classic on this list i think um, it, was, it was such a classic. I thought they were going to forget it. Yeah, because it's not. It's it, it's a by an artist that has a very beloved queer cult what? following. It is loved by the indie scene, which means Rolling Stone doesn't care because they go, ah, that shit's for pitchfork. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Thirty. We're here to tell you the Beatles are good for the twentieth time in your life. Thirty-seven is Britney Spears stronger which is like a solidly B-tier Britney Spears single. Yeah, um, but also it has nothing to do with the queer people. Now I'm stronger than yesterday. Now it's nothing but my way. My loneliness ain't killing me no more. Oh, oh like, because she's back, back to the other song she did. It's a song about her life. Like, it's very clearly not a queer, like, uh. It's an interesting example of how those sorts of um, songs can get very, very easily co-opted by the queer community and can become queer retroactively. Like, we could say Britney Spears is stronger could be adopted as a gay anthem. I'm like, okay, where's Robin? <laughs> 35 is Casey Musgrave's Rainbow, which is the funniest pick so far, simply because... What? It's rainbow. Uh, it's got to be gay. You know, the gays, they like the rainbows. It, yeah, it, I mean, literally. It's a great song. And it's like, yes. what's so funny about it was, is just for me is that when I, I remember when this came out, because it was one of the first songs she released after the uh, golden hour cycle had kind of died down. And I was like, oh shit. I was, and it was one of the reasons why I was so excited for Starcrossed. And then just to remember how brutally that album let us all down this was an unpleasant reminder um, i'm also thinking about when it comes to songs named rainbow kesha's is probably more okay than this one kesha's rainbow is 100 percent a gayer song than this 100 percent. so 34 we have janet jackson's together again which is a great pick um 30, yeah okay 33 we have a late era kylie minogue song called all the lovers which i haven't heard but i'm sure is very very gay 32, we have Sam Smith and Demi Lovato's I'm Ready, which, fuck that, came and went, didn't it? I, I really have to appreciate Sam Smith, because Sam Smith really proves that trans people don't have to be good at music. 
<laughs> if like, we're gonna go with a Demi Lovato tune, "Cool for the Summer" is yeah, right cool for there. The summer. <laughs> Sam Smith is like not just like an example of you know here's a queer artist who's bad, but like a queer artist who's actually incredibly talented but squanders it. It basically yeah. every single chance they get. It's it's truly remarkable. I mean, That's I'm really... big. Is I almost am kind of happy about something like unholy even if it's not completely my thing because at least it's interesting <laughs> i would have like i would have rather that they chose I, i'm unholy than i'm ready because yeah would have at least had a bit more of a like kick of the teeth feel to it because we've got enough songs on this list already that's like love who you love and then be in love and love's awesome to have a song like unholy which is just about like being a fucking deviant <laughs> That's be- why Cool for the Summer should be on here because that's just a song about girls kissing girls and shit. Like, come on. Anyway. It's far too aggressive. Uh, it's better than dancing with a stranger, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, number 31. It almost feels like cheating to be doing this one so early. I, I was in the third grade. I thought that I was gay because I could draw. There we go. Macklemore. <laughs> oh, oh, really? Mary Lambert. Come on, Lambert. man. Imagine telling someone that 10 years ago Macklemore was cool to like. This song is maybe you know, for better or worse, and it's certainly arguably for worse uh, for from our standpoint. This song is probably one of the most significant pop culture works of queer, like statements about queerness that's ever been released. And it is a song uh, God, by that's a, depressing. And it is a it's in the same by... way that Boys Don't Cry is technically a very important queer pop culture moment. Like, it... no one queer was consulted, but it's still. It's about someone who is just expressing this painful level of guilt about their own fucking identity. And you don't, in some ways, worse than being, like, openly ignorant and just maybe even mean-spirited is acting, like, guilty and prostrating yourself against your own like straightness or cisness or whatever it is or whiteness and make more sure like doing that one yeah making that the whole thing and that's the thing as well is that like certainly one day he'll text us about how he regrets picking the song and how we think that we should have won the awards instead but certainly Mary Lambert's contribution to the song a a great um lesbian singer songwriter certainly her contribution to the song with the hook is a pretty iconic and probably the most moving part of the whole song if i'm honest but it's not enough to redeem this hollowness that carries across this across the rest of it it's uh this is like including that one uh 1975 song on uh notes on a conditional form where maddie healy was like oh people tease me for being gay because of my hair (laughs) i was gonna say this isn't even the best version of same love angel hayes did a better cover of it 29 is this is obviously an artist who's very important to the lesbian community and so i don't really i can't really comment because i've tried to get into the music and i just feel like it's not really marketed very well to me uh which is Haley kyoko's girls like girls uh, i like it i, I like Haley kyoko my girlfriend is very pro this inclusion i i fully support Haley kyoko and, and everything that she stands for I, there's better kaylee kyoko songs number 28 is a deep cut from miss sears 2015 lp this is acting called bird set free <laughs> and that's all that we need to say Sia's song called Bird Set Free is number 28 on the most inspirational eject, eject, abort, no yeah, with her throaty belt Sia turns the track into the emotional high of a sweeping oh character. god, I can't think of a less sexy combination of words than throaty belt number 27 is an artist who another artist who I just have an irrational dislike for, or maybe slightly more rational, which is Miss Jesse J's song. That's what I was gonna say. I hate you are. I cannot fucking stand not a real artist. It's all about the money. D minus Katy Perry. I just think that's that so that's grim. the title track to Jesse J's 2011 album, she performed Who You Are, is a towering power ballad that acknowledges I, the melancholy that can come with being yourself, I but ultimately serves as an, an encouraging self-empowerment anthem. It's one of the singer's most beloved and most requested songs. People still oh, request things of Jesse J? People as still request things in general? Like it was according up their radio station in 2020. According to IK, 
This um, is a very requested song. Number 26 is the title track from Lizzo's most recent album, Special. This album's a real guilty pleasure, and I like Lizzo. I, 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 remember, I was on the podcast for that this album, and I remember being like, it's okay, it's very divided, and, and, and it's good. And this is one of the songs that I was we're not as into. About, we're talking about because... the most inspirational LGBTQ songs of all time. We've already had Janet Jackson on this list, and at 26, we're talking about this random Lizzo song that isn't even the best Lizzo song you could have possibly picked for this. Yeah, it's not even... It it feels so weird to put it on here because it is basically yeah, but, just you're you're pretty cool. There's nothing about being queer. It just the the the, the Lizzo song you should pick is like a girl, and it's solely because of that. If you feel like a girl, then you feel like a girl line, which is the hardest shit she's in. Or as they mentioned, everybody's gay <laughs> or soulmate, which they also mentioned. Like there's any number of great Lizzo songs, and I would not. Boys. <laughs> Number twenty five though, Miley Cyrus. Yeah, lime. This is the most. What is the one logic behind this? Because being gay is a climb or something. What is what is the point of including of including an LGBT artist and then not including a song that they do have about being gay? About climbing like... up those cheeks and putting your penis <laughs> in another man's asshole. I'm anyway. gonna shoot myself on camera. Number 24 See, is... is Kish's We Are Who We Are. You know, what? I am I am also okay with this. It's a good song. I just love that Rolling Stone chooses to to lead their description of this with the backstory about how the song was inspired by a string of teen suicides. Uh <laughs> Which is just an incredible piece of context to lead with. Why not him? Why not Rainbow? Now, okay, all right. So the next one is the worst one so far. I even I don't know if there's a worse one. So okay, I'm... here's the thing though. I'll say the reason why I said Miley Cyrus is the worst one is because it's so irrelevant. At least this one technically does have to do with this. Well, look, look, we 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 haven't said what it is yet, so I'm I'm just setting it up. Th okay. This. I know it's going to create some frustration because we have um, adjacent to us right now. We have uh, some some Taylor Swift supporters in in the realm, but we need you need to calm down. Is not one of the most inspirational LGBTQ songs of all time. I refuse to accept this. Two thirds of it is about people who don't like Taylor Swift. It's not even that she's a straight. I mean, that's fine. What she does in principle is fine. But why so are don't you say that to Twitter? Why are you mad when you could be glad? Like glad as in for a dollar, name a queer artist. Two thirds of the songs are about being a world famous pop star that gets mean comments. Well, that is true as well. It's it's only tangentially really about the gay thing. So that there is only one verse about it. In that sense, Lily Allen's "fuck you" is just as much of a queer anthem. Yeah, that's they had a better where song. Is, where is Lily Allen on this? Yeah, list? Lily Allen should be on this. Right. Fucking Katie yeah, Perry's where? "You're So Gay" would be better on this list than "You Need to Calm Down." <laughs> oh, they have a different choice for Katie Perry. And well, I know we'll get to that. Twenty-two is Beyonce's "Break My Soul," which you can't read. Really Great pick. Um, yeah. Moving down the list, we've got Queen's "I Want to Break Free" at twenty. Great pick. You've got to have Good a Queen back song. Yeah. You've got to have a Queen song on here. Uh, Stephanie Mills never knew a love like this before. Great pick. Also, good. Alton John's I'm Still Standing. Great Should pick. Be we're we're in an auspiciously good run here until we get to number 17 on this list. This is me from the Ryan greatest Lewis showman. makes his return. <laughs> Fucking This is me from the greatest show. <laughs> the lead single from the greatest showman soundtrack. Now, not to detract. Not to detract from Miss Keela Settle, who I'm sure has her own amazing story that's all very inspirational and that we should all be very, very happy about or whatever. Can I just say that making a movie about P.T. Barnum and then fucking turning it into this like twisted, warped pride celebration thing in the most like fucking Lin Manuel Miranda ass way possible and then using that to catch yeah. the song as anodyne and just so crushingly stupid as this is me to the top of the charts is as jaded as i've ever felt it's, it's actually homophobic 
Also, may I remind you that Kayla Settle's role in that film is to play the bearded lady. <laughs> I'm not trying to insult any of any un, any unwillingly uh, bearded women because I, I'm sure it's a very real thing that has very real world consequences. Trust me, I deal with it. <laughs> but no one gets it's there, funny. Riley. <laughs> it's, that's it. It's kind of funny, and that t- sort of detracts a little bit from it for me. Um, well, also, like, because, like, it's not about being queer, and that's the issue with, like, it's not about being trans and having, struggling it's, with it's facial hair, or being a woman about it. It's about being cowards. a carny. <laughs> because they're cowards. It's like, well, you can kind of see that it's sort of like being gay. It's just like, there are songs about actually being gay. About Hi, being Lewis, in... you're so talented. Why do you keep doing this? Um, about being an outsider because you have a vestigial tail or whatever. You know, still makes more sense than you need to calm down. Number Fucking sixteen. God. We're back into 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 good picks with Donna Summer's "I Feel Love." Obviously, a classic. Oh, great disco. Pick. That's oh, yeah. Uh, Not a lot of disco on this list, surprisingly. Number should 15, be a lot more. Number fifteen. We have a Brandy Carlisle song about gay kids. Apparently, I don't. Yeah, sure. Yeah, Brandy Carlisle's cool. Enough. Number yeah, 40, I'm sure that's fine. Number forty. Do, hey, it's, hey, it's, hey, it, hey. It is in fact a queer person. So, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, good. For yeah, him. don't don't be hating, uh, Riley. I'm not, I'm not be expected to know every fucking queer, whatever. Oh, I I don't know. Like, yes, you should people. be actually. And we, we all know it's true gay. Mind. Name five gays. <laughs> this is a hive mind, mind, you fuck. Number 14 is Mariah Carey's Hero, which is uh, obviously you need to have a Mariah Carey song on here or whatever. But if instead they yeah. put the, the the Chad Kroger, Josie Scott Hero on here instead. Oh, this is great. Right after that, we've got at 13, David Bowie's Heroes. Which, See, that's what makes it better. It's plural. Which is barely. What? Barely a song about being gay. It's a song it's about. It's not even. No, it's not. It's about meeting a lover at at the Berlin Wall because you've been divided, and it's inspired by a story about a me- about one of his producers who is cheating on his wife and met his his Called mistress Romeo and Juliet at the Berlin Wall. And let me tell you, it was a straight couple too. There's so many more gay David Bowie songs. Heroes is one of the greatest songs of all time. You will hear no dissenting opinions here. But like, no. It is certainly one of maybe one of the most inspirational like, songs in general of all time. There's sure. like a sense of transcendent hope that comes through in that song. But yeah. John, I'm only dying would be a better pick. Yeah. Rebel Rebel. The song the where he talks reason. about looking for some ass on Black Star would be a better pick. <laughs> uh, number 12 we've got diana ross's i'm coming out which frankly should be in the top three but it's fine yeah probably i don't care that it's not technically about that it's just such a perfect one for, number yeah. 11 is madonna's express yourself which i guess i just think that song's kind of overrated there I, are so many better madonna songs that they could have picked i like it though yeah i mean it's I, I guess vogue number 10 we have gloria Gaynor's i will survive which yeah sure okay. No, yeah, sure. no complaints here. George Michael's Freedom at number nine, which is also, I'm glad that George Michael made the top. Yeah, mm. absolutely. Yeah. Should be yeah. higher, honestly. Number eight, we have, and here we go again, Sarah <laughs> Burrell's Brave. It's a, it, who? You know, it's Sarah Burrell's is one of the more talented songwriters in terms of pop music. I I'm won't not like, I you know. Know. I'm not questioning her credentials here, but is she, is she queer? Like it doesn't matter if she, I don't think so because I get the message of the song. Well, I mean, she she she's been on Broadway for years, so basically, yeah, That's honorary it. gay. Yeah, I again, this is not a case of being like, oh, gay people are stupid if they find this song inspirational. It's just a case of me being like, this song is so cringe to me that I find it hilarious on this list. Um, but maybe I'm out. On- oh, okay. I just looked it up. Brave was apparently inspired by her friend coming out. Her friend. I have a. I, I have gay friends. I'm not saying that I think it's a. It, it should be in the top ten. Some of my best friends are those sinning queers. <laughs> Number seven is Cindy Lauper's True Colors, which is one of my least favorite songs of the '80s. Sorry, not sorry. Oh my god! I didn't even know this. Number six is fucking Moon Eye. Why do we You're wrong. have a Moon You're song wrong. here? You're so wrong. Fucking garbage band. 
God, at least it's not Silk Chiffon. It's I Know a Place, which is not as bad of a song as Silk Chiffon. I M O. But um probably and, something off their second album would be better anyway. An uplifting reminder that home is where you make it out to be and with whom you choose to make it. Why is this number six? Why is this ahead of half of the songs we've talked about already? The fact that a lot of these are ahead of like Donna Summers is like a little weird, but you know it, I, I will stand up for Muna. I, I I'm getting a feeling I might be the only person here who will. Oh, I agree. <laughs> I, I, I like them fine. Number five is the worst song on Rina Sawayama's album Sawayama, which is Chosen Family. Um, no, okay, no, oh, I feel like yeah. we're gonna, I'm not sure if I'd agree with that. But I feel like I we're going to be in a similar there. situation here where, you know, if you're a certain type of queer, it's going to be a song that means a lot to you. And if you're a different type of queer, it's going to be the kind of song that makes you want to rip your skin off. And unfortunately, <laughs> I, am, I fall into the latter category. I, I find this song to be unbearable but again look even if you like this song great awesome why is this number five why are we getting yeah top 10 i don't talking about muna and this fucking Re- rena sawayama song that no one would remember if it didn't like spawn the chosen family meme god sorry i just i i will say like what i i i don't think it's a terrible pick although i I, I will say, as someone who really likes that Sawayama album, I am much more inspired by Excess because it's about making a lot of money I, and dancing, and I fucking I relate to that. would have picked Excess over basically anything. Great song. Also not an inspirational LGBTQ song. No, but well, you know it, what? It, it, it inspires it is me as, as a queer person. gay is half of the shit on here, you frankly. Pick a song. So. If you're gonna, I, if I, as a queer person, it inspires me to want to listen to good music like it. And frankly, <laughs> most of this list does not do that. If you're gonna so... pick a song off of that album, to me, the obvious pick is Comme des Garçons. Like, I, that's the obvious pick for a list <laughs> like this. If you're gonna pick a song off that album, but whatever. Number four, we have our second Casey Musgrave song, Follow Your Arrow, which, to be fair, is also yeah. a good Casey Musgrave song, but it is. But she, also, I believe she is the only artist on here with two songs. As the description oh, no. the Rolling Stone article points out, it's one of many songs that uh, it's one of many like gay songs that does the thing of like vaguely gesturing towards gayness in a way that's supposed to be super meaningful. Kiss lots of boys or kiss lots of girls if that's something you're into. Is this the best we could do? Number four, most inspirational songs of the uh, most inspirational LB, LB, LGBTQ cool. songs of all time. Number four is, I guess, Kiss People, if you're into that. That's that's where we're at here. Number three is Katy Perry's Firework. Oh, oh yeah, there is no other Katy Perry this, song. This on is her. the yeah. worst pick on this list. Yeah. You know, look, it's the song where Katy Perry's tits explode in the music video. I guess that's a moment. I guess that's a sleigh. Listen, I get that I Kissed a Girl is problematic for being like... It's a better it, pick than this! It, it, it is, it is. That, that was song. the point I was going to get to. I'm not <laughs> saying it's a good song, Riley! I'm no, saying but it's, it's a homophobic song, song, Jake! I am, I don't fucking care! Look, that is, that is peak queer culture right there, if anything. What is queer than something homophobia. being homophobic and then co-opted by the queer community? Exactly. You know, I kissed the girl. You know what? Hot and cold. Whatever. You're missing fucking, the point. I, the I opposition my here is like fucking firework. You absolute buffoon. <laughs> you clown. Frankly, as a queer person, I'm inspired by Katy Perry's ET. Personally, that that's a real one. That's a real queer. That's just queer. funny. That's a real queer <laughs> anthem. Like, thing is, and this is kind of where I come down. Is I understand that a lot of these songs are, are either about queerness or co-opted by the queer community because they have a particular cultural significance and they mean a lot. But I just find any song that is queer in the sense that it vaguely alludes to being different to be just like what not only woefully underwhelming, but also kind of just like pathetic. I mean, it's cowardly. And it's not, it just I don't even simply... blame Katy Perry for this because I don't think she's trying to like make a queer anthem or a queer bait really all that much with this song in particular. No, Katy yeah. was being edgy. That's all she wanted to do. 
but but i just find that the the celebration of this is the third most inspirational lgbtq song of all time it's kind of just ridiculous we could argue that the two songs she made that are homophobic but technically just does queer stuff are bet are better choices and i the- would make that argument like is mm. you're so gay and i kissed the girl are they great queer representation no or do they contain more representation than firework yes, yes. they are explicitly alluding to queerness so there's there's just yes. there's that aspect they're allowed there, to there exist is, uh, we yeah. are not supposed to instead of this version more. where we're like uh there, there there's an overweight girl could, in this video that's kind of like being gay you know I actually i know you were joking before emily but i actually legitimately think et would have been a better pick <laughs> hey that. monster fucker representation is important yeah you know i'm trying to remember how kanye's verse on that goes i'm <laughs> i don't think kanye I'm trying not to remember. number two is christina aguilera is beautiful which is a classic uh yeah it's not a song uh, I particularly feel compelled to come back to all that much. An agreeable no, thing. but it makes sense. Yeah, it yeah, makes sense. That, that's here's the thing. Like I, we're making Christina fun of Firework. Aguilera. If Firework was in like the forties, I don't think we would. We would be like, that makes sense, even if I don't like the song. Mm. Like we'd be like, that at least yeah. makes sense. It's the fact that they're, that it's so high. Beautiful at least yeah. makes sense more. But even then, like. I wouldn't put it that high, but I get why Rolling Stone puts it that high, if that makes sense. Like, this is a very Billboard.com pick. Yeah, and I mean, it is a song that, you know, it means a lot to a lot of people. Number one is Lady Gaga's Born This Way, which you could do a lot worse than. I would have put this... It's yeah. not even the best <laughs> gay Lady Gaga song on that album. I would That's have, true. I would have chosen this just because it is the most significant, but I probably wouldn't have put it at number one. I probably would have, would have put it sort of more towards the middle tier of the list. But I acknowledge its significance. I acknowledge how big it is and how successful it is. But yeah, yeah. the poker face above it, though. Mm. Well, sometimes you're just a motorcycle you know sometimes you, you just you put your head on a motorcycle and and that's that's pretty gay if you ask me yeah i mean there's something that there's something that truly captures the you know ephemer, ephemeral like transhuman ideal of, of gender ephemera that better nothing does that better than, than lady gaga's head on a motorbike exactly but i'm always saying this of all the artists to have multiple times on here, Casey Musgraves, but not Lady Gaga. Yeah, that's fucked. Yeah, you could have is on, on, on here, even not though that Lady one's Gaga, clearly not about John, being gay. Not... No Frank Ocean Weird on here. Artists. Yeah, thinking about you. Well, I guess that's not inspirational. That's pretty sad. Uh, yeah, bad no, Religion, Chanel. Yeah, does Frank Ocean have any inspirational songs? Let's be sure. Chanel. I'm not sure Frank Ocean Chanel. has any anthems. Oh, wow. Also, uh, no Janelle Monet. Yeah, well, yeah Janelle, Janelle Monet should be on here. What Janelle the Monet's fuck? Janelle Monet's whole re- mo- new album should be on here. Frankly, yes. No Little Nas Absolutely. X is on here. Like yeah, that's Montero like a good and industry. That's like baby. a good old person pick too. Like they'd be like the gays like Little Nas X. Like why? Don't, like come on. Sylvester's you, "You Make Me Feel Mighty Real" isn't on here. That no Village People. No big freedom. Ah, uh, that's egregious. I can't believe there's no shoot you on this most inspirational LGBTQ songs. <laughs> you aspire to want to die. No, I'm yeah, like, where's where's slow torture puke chamber on this? What a what an embarrassment of a list. It's okay to cry by Sophie should be on this list. Yeah, no, that's, so that's number you one. You know what's baby. an obvious one? Okay, I remember thinking like, are these guys too obscure for Rolling Stone? And then I went, no, Laura Jane Grace came out on the cover of Rolling Stone. Where the fuck is the ocean? Black me out. Trans Soul Rebels. My life six. Yeah, <laughs> True Trans Soul Rebels like top three. That's fucking. I'll take Rock Lobster from the B fifty twos. Because at least someone <laughs> gay made that song. I'll take every every B fifty two song is honorary gay anthem. Love Even Shack, like cover Abba, of Abba should be an honorary song. pick here. Unironically, why is there not a single Village People song on here? No, that's ridiculous. Like I get you could argue like, oh, is it inspirational? I don't know, but everyone fucking sings it. 
Nothing inspires me more to put my penis in another man than listening to YMCA. Exactly. Frankly, we haven't done enough rejection of the prompt at hand to begin with. I do not want to, an inspirational LGBTQ anthem. I want something that accurately reflects the misery. Well, that's the thing. That's why I, I, I'm a very excited SLK on the list, because that's how I celebrate my misery. Hootie Fruity by Little Richard should be on this list. <laughs> So true. He, he, I don't. I'm not even the biggest Kim Petras fan, but come on. That looks so Actually, easy. you know what? I'm glad there's no Kim Petras on this list because no, the thing about I, Kim yeah. Petras is that even though she's a trans artist, she's like so fucking cowardly about actually singing about that in a meaningful way that yeah. that any song you could pick from her would just be like it would be like a joke. But even then, it's such an obvious choice. It's such a non-entity so. now that we didn't even, none of us even thought to talk about her new album, which just came out, because none of us have even bothered to listen to it. It's not going to listen to I that shit after Slut Pop. Do you think I'm insane? I, I still don't really even know who this person is. I'm surprised there's no Clay Aiken on here. <laughs> well, Good I'm God. Not. I have not heard that name. <laughs> Thank God for so time. fucking mercies. Like, that's the thing, though. Like, we are laughing at that. But, like, if you mention it to your mom, who is more likely to buy an imprint Rolling Stone magazine, she remembers Claire Aiken. Claire Aiken. Claire Aiken, <laughs> Claire Aiken after he transitions. <laughs> Congratulations. Girl in Red, King Princess. So, artist that I'm not even a big fan of, but I'm like... At least gay. that suck. Yeah, REM like fucking yeah, I, I stipes was bisexual. That, I was thinking about REM, but again, I just don't think they have any inspirational queer songs. But yeah, shop boys. I, 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 as a queer person, relate a lot to uh, let's make lots of money. Yeah, um, that's that's the excess of the eighties. I, I just think that to sum it all up, to wrap this. I think it's just I've always I just find it really funny that the Sum way it up gay people are a land of contrasts. The, the way that Rolling Stone have pitched this as most inspirational LGBTQ songs, like positioning themselves as in this particular light as you know, these bastions of celebrating the positivity of queerness. And it's just if I can add on before you finish that thought, and when we say from Rolling no. Stone, we mean it. By Rolling Stone staff. Yeah. They have no one credited. Of course. And this is the thing, right? Is that it, it's just a bit rich coming from, you know, U2 and Bruce Springsteen are the album of the year every year and nothing else matters. Put your money where your mouth is, Rolling Stone. Not wrong about Springsteen, though. I mean, come on. Reeking Ball is, wouldn't be the best album of any year. Yeah, but like it's Bruce, I can't hate. How about uh, how about fourteen eighty BC? That pretty slim pickings there. Nah, I you released reckon, that then, way ahead of its time. I reckon the fucking uh, Tudor period had some bangers. Anyway, let us know at home what you think of this Rolling Stone list of the most inspirational LGBTQ songs of all time. What would be on your list? What do you think should have been higher, lower? No, Charlie XCX. I just realized that one too. Yeah. Stick around for our next video where Emily will be joining us to discuss new albums from Swans and Home is Where. Talking about gay representation, not gay, trans representation. Although Michael, S Michael Smith, Michael Gera might be gay. We don't know. He talks a lot about God. It's pretty gay. Anyway. Look, More like Michelle showed... Gera. Look, I just think if you showed somebody from 1480 a Bruce Springsteen song, they'd be like, that fucking rules. That's all I'm saying. As always, folks, rock over London, rock on Chicago, BMO, making money makes sense.